Thank you, Wendy. So taking a look at historical things, I've found that history often repeats itself. And we can also learn a lot by going outside our industry and seeing what happens in other industries as far as giving us insights and ways forward in our own in our own industry. So I was looking at this and I thought, okay, what, what can horseshoes, hand grenades, and history teach us about software estimates? So I've come up with a, you know, kind of a high level agenda that we'd like to go to through today. I'd like to talk a little bit about the idiom that close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades and nuclear bombs. A little bit of a history lesson. What does close enough mean when we're talking about software development projects? using history to create realistic estimates and better results. And I'd like to introduce to you an initiative that I'm working on with the International Cost Estimation and Analysis Association called the Software Cost Estimation Body of Knowledge, or Software CBOC. So first off, who am I? I'm a mechanical engineer in classical training who lives and relocated to Florida 25 years ago, and so that's actually one of my pictures of one of the amazing sunsets we get here. I'm a PMP. I'm a Certified Function Point Specialist Fellow, which means that I've done function points and software measurement for more than 25 years. I'm a project, I'm a professional engineer. I'm the CEO of Quality Plus Technologies. I'm a lead author of the ICS Software Cost Estimation Body of Knowledge. That's my current contract. I'm a past president of the International Function Point Users Group, and I've been a ISO, IEC, International Standards Project Editor um, since 1994. I'm a consultant. I've written a number of different books. I've been a co-author and an author. I'm a speaker and an instructor, and one of my favorite things to do is to kind of demystify technological or technically complex. So I welcome you here today. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're part of this. So first off, let's talk about the idiom. It came out in about 1914. And the idiom is it's an American idiom that close only counts in horseshoes. And then over the years, people added or hand grenades. And then other people added it or nuclear bombs. So the literal meaning of the idiom is derived from the fact that the game of horseshoes which is actually taking horseshoes, metal horseshoes that are standard size, hurling them across a field of a standard length and trying to ring or actually circle in circle a post that is standing up. So points are won in horseshoes by landing your horseshoe within a horseshoe's breadth, which is actually kind of like the width, six inches of the stake, even if it doesn't ring, in other words, circle the stake or touch the stake, a player gets one point for being close, being within six inches, one point for actually leaning on the post, and three points for an actual ringer. So that's where this whole idiom came from, that close only counts in horseshoes. Likewise, hand grenade that explodes in the vicinity of its target. So it doesn't have to be right smack dab on the target, but it explodes in the vicinity of its target rather than directly on it can still inflict lethal damage, as can a nuclear bomb. So in, in other words, close also counts. So what does close mean when we're talking about software development projects? When we're talking about software estimation, what do we mean by close? And does close count in software development? Well, let's take a look at something. Let's do a little bit of a history lesson. What do you think close means for software projects? Well, the Standish Group started in 1996 producing something called the Chaos Report. And it defined project outcomes as being successful or challenged or failed. Now, their definition of a successful project means that it would be on time, on budget, with all of the required stakeholder or user features. So it actually meets the needs of the users. Challenge projects would mean that, yeah, they actually were delivered, but they were delivered either late and or they were over budget and or they were missing some of the features. In other words, the scope was reduced. 
And they defined a failed project as being a project that was not delivered at all, or it was canceled partway through. So what does close actually mean when, in this context? Well, if we take a look at the project success rates and the Standish Group Chaos Report, which they produce every, it used to be every year, and then I think they went to every three years or something like that. But if you take a look at the project success rates and you look at the left-hand side um, graphic. Whether we're using Agile, software development paradigm as a way of producing our, our creating and developing our software, or Waterfall, if we're using Agile methods, we can be successful, in other words, on time and on budget with the, the required features about 42% of the time. On a Waterfall type project, we're only successful about 26% of the time. And this has been throughout the 30 years or the 20-some 20, 20 years since 1996 when they started producing this. So this has gone up and down a little bit, but it's never, ever even approached 50%. It's more likely around the 30% or 33% that one in three projects is considered successful. In Agile projects, which ones are considered challenged? So in other words, they're either late and or they're over budget and or they're going to deliver with less features. So 50% of the projects, one in two done in Agile, are considered challenged. 53% in waterfall projects are considered challenged. Oh, that's not, that's not even good. Well, what about the failed projects, the outright failed projects that are canceled or just didn't deliver at all? 8% of Agile projects and 21% of Waterfall projects. Yikes, that's not very good. Well, what does this actually mean? Does that mean that we're just better at estimating on Agile projects than we are on Waterfall projects? Or maybe we're just not very good at estimating in the first place. Well, if you take a look at the right-hand side uh, depiction, which is the Project Management Institute study from 2017, and they started taking a look at a bunch of different things. They said, okay, let's take a look at the goals and whether or not things match the original budget. Let's do kind of from 2011 through to 2017. Let's take a look at how software projects and, and just projects overall, how are we doing? If you take a look at the original budget, meeting the original budget, it's less than 60%. On time, we're less than 50%. And losing the original budget, that happens 30%. So this isn't really a good situation, is it? What do you think? Is software based on estimates a good investment? And I'll ask you to just put your answers into the chat. What do you think? Is software development based on estimates? a good investment. Would you invest in my project if you knew that your investment might have a 26% chance of, of being successful? Or that 50-50 is going to be challenged? Or there's a one in five chance that you're going to lose your investment altogether? Would you invest in a project like that? Well, that's kind of a loaded question. If you knew what the result was going to be before you got into it and you knew you were going to lose your money, you probably wouldn't invest in the first place. So a little bit more of a history lesson. Software projects in terms of cost and schedule growth is a legacy of disaster. If you take a look at the different types of projects, Olympics, which are absolutely always over budget and late. If you take a look at dams or construction projects or NASA or the Department of Defense or rail projects or bridges or trenches or tunnels or roads, we often compare software engineering to classical engineering. Well, let's take a look at software or IT projects or software development projects. The average cost growth is 43 to 56%. The frequency of this happening is 8 out of 10. The frequency of actually doubling our estimates is 1 in 4. Average schedule delays, 63 to 84%. And how often does that happen? A lot. 
Well, it's very common. Multiple industries experience significant cost of schedule growth. It's been a problem for a long time. We know that this is an issue. The frequency. Well, 70 to 80 percent of projects across the board have issues. But when you take a look purely at IT, we've got cost of schedule growth absolutely happens. Now, part of this is due to our cone of uncertainty because we just don't know what we're estimating. We have a high cost. Cost is 50 percent or more on average in terms of the mean. The schedule, wow, at least 30 percent or more average. And then we've got cost growth in excess of 100 percent. It's a common occurrence in most projects. And this comes from Kristen Smart's brand new book called Solving for Risk Management, Understanding the Critical Role of Uncertainty in Project Management. But let's take a look at high profile software projects. Were the estimates even close? Well, in Canada, there was a Phoenix Federal Pay System, which was a commercial off the shelf package, software package solution. The original budget was $310 million Canadian. Um, the project ran from 2009 to 2016. In May 2018, it was the project was launched and actually was working software in May in um, 2016. Two years later, they were $600,000 in payback locks. People were not getting paid. Civil servants were not getting their money. They were not getting their paychecks. And in 2019, and this is just amazing, $2.6 billion Canadian dollars had to be spent to stabilize the data as kind of a re, re, pre-replacement. Yikes, that wasn't a very good estimate to begin with. 310 million Canadian budget? No. Denver Airport baggage system, well, what happened on that one? $560 million US dollars and it was over budget. 16 month delay, the system was finally scrapped due to poor project communication and scope creep. They consider it one of the, the worst managed projects in history. Then there was healthcare.gov. You might remember the original healthcare.gov in the times of Obama. It was an agile project. $860 million U.S. spent, $150 million overrun. It was a failed agile project. 36 states, there were 10 times the users than they expected, and the project was eventually just completely abandoned and scrapped. And we've got an example in the distribution and the logistics industry where Miller Coors merged and they were using ERP or Enterprise Resource Planning Packages such as SAP or PeopleSoft. And the merger resulted in seven different instances of SAP software. This project failed miserably. It was an integration project with an overspent by $100 million. It ended up in a U.S. Uh, lawsuit with a countersuit and they were suing and suing and suing and they finally scheduled it, settled it out of court. So estimates didn't cause these projects to fail. There were a lot of issues on these projects. But why were the estimates so far off? Were they even close? Here's some of the reasons cited for software project failure. Poor user input, stakeholder conflict, Big requirements, none of these will come as a surprise to any of you. But poor cost and schedule estimation, overly optimistic, risk avoidance, or risk not even being identified at all. That's an issue. Skills that don't match the job, well, we can, we can fix that with training. Hidden costs of going mean and lean with unrealistic goals and resources. Well, what's the problem with doing poor cost and schedule estimation. There's a lot of issues, a lot of problems that can come up. What is the impact of doing unrealistic estimates? And unrealistic estimates meaning overly optimistic. Overly optimistic, in other words, we're estimating our cost that's it's unreasonably low and the duration that is unreasonably short. And we overlook or avoid risk. What's the issue with this? Well, we end up with 81 billion U.S. dollars in canceled software projects. That's a lot. 59 billion dollars in budget overruns. Okay, so we're really bad at estimating. 
what does this cause? If I estimate something that is only half the actual cost that it should take, if I estimate that I can build a hospital in a month, and I know reasonably it's going to take six months, and I assign or an award a, a contract for that one-month project, it's going to fail because I've got way too little time, money, in order for anybody to do a good job. And what happens then? If we compress the schedule beyond reasonable amount, if we reduce the budget unreasonably, people can't do good work. We end up with cost overruns, absolutely major cost overruns. We end up with shortcuts being taken. And if you take shortcuts, you end up with poor quality. We cut testing. There's all sorts of issues. If we could get a more realistic estimate and award our contracts based on historical projects, based on what we know is going to happen instead of theoretical, this is going to be the greatest project ever. If we can align our estimates, with realism and do a better job, then we're going to have realistic contracts. Then people can actually deliver as opposed to being short-circuited before they even start. Can we use history to create better estimates and better results? I absolutely believe we can. So we can take a look at some considerations and some best practices. We can look at the estimating maturity model cone of uncertainty. Things like cost and schedule growth that are repeatable. Data analysis and normalization, that is really, really important. And we can take a look at some estimating techniques that are suitable and set up specifically for software cost estimation. Now, I'm going to ask a question, and I know I've got a number of participants here. How many of you are in the software development industry or are you in the cost estimating industry? So I'm just going to ask you to, to um, enter your answers in the chat box if you wouldn't mind. Are you in the software development industry? So you're a developer or a project manager? Or are you in the cost estimating industry where you want to learn a little bit more about what's unique about estimating software? I'll give you a couple more minutes. So we've got some people that are in project management, people that are developers, people that are in software development itself. Well, one of the things that I've discovered, having been in software development for a long time and in measurement, is that I had no idea that cost estimation was an actual profession. And that cost estimation is an art and a science of being able to take a look at what you're estimating, what is the basis of your estimates, and being able to quantify and make clear what you're actually estimating. So we're going to go through and take a look at what is the difference. If you've, if you've done hardware estimation, software is completely different. If you've done bridges and roads, I'm sorry, software is different and has some uniqueness. So let's take a look at maybe using some history to create better realistic estimates. This is the estimating maturity model, which you probably have never, never seen. This comes out of work by Dan Galareth and Esteban Sanchez of Galareth.com. Many companies do not follow any sort of formal estimating practices at all. And so if we take a look here at level one, level one is kind of the basis, and this kind of follows the same type of thing as the capability maturity model and takes a look at what are the processes that are in place for doing software cost estimation. Usually companies start out as informal or no process at all. We end up saying, how much, how much will that cost to do? Well, I kind of sort of think it might be kind of sort of similar to something we did kind of sort of a couple of months ago, and it's a little bit similar to this, or maybe there's another project we can base it on, or we go and we look at expert opinion. But mostly, we start out with people with spreadsheets 
and we end up with somebody that sits in a corner office that started collecting some data and said, I can do an estimate here. I can create a good estimate. That's the informal or no process stage. When we start taking a look at historical project history or historical project data, we find out that things are completely incomparable. It's not normalized at all. If I ask you how many hours did it take to do a particular project, you may tell me, Carol, our, our project records show it was 1,000 hours. And I'll ask you, okay, that 1,000 hours on project one, you also spent 1,000 hours on project two. We might even say, you know what, we size them. And project one is a certain size and project two is a certain size. And people spend a lot of time and effort making sure that our sizes are correct. We can use function points or we can use number of requirements or we can use things like number of changes. We can, we can normalize our size really, really well. And we can take a look at that. We can say, We've lined up everything. It's all a development project, all of that. But when we start taking a look at project hours, that's where there's some really big problems with normalization of our data. What is a project hour? Somebody could tell me, Carol, every project hour is 60 minutes, and every project minute is 60 seconds. But our project hour is comparable. It's got to be one of your very first questions. And no, they're not, because who's in the corral? Whose time have we allocated to the project? What's included in the activities? Was it an agile project? Was it a waterfall project? When did we start the project? Did we start it when we first assigned feasibility? Did we start at the beginning of requirements? Did we start at the beginning of prototyping? And where's the end of the project? Did it, did it end three weeks after we, we released it? Was it after we deployed it? Was it after we installed the first place? And what about overtime? Did we include overtime or wasn't it included? We have a lot of normalization issues that can come into play when we're taking a look at software project effort, especially historical. So at level one, we're not really doing any of that. We're taking estimates as a wild guess done by developers or project managers. and no offense to project managers and project developers. Absolutely, you're going to take your best crack at things. But if we're doing a bottom-up estimate, there's things that are going to be missed. Did you know that on an average project, there is between 30 and 60% rework done? That doesn't get factored in if we're doing a bottom-up expert, expert estimate or expert opinion estimate. So there's considerations there. So most of us start out, and we are at level one in terms of an estimate maturity. Level two says, you know what? We're going to actually introduce a formal sizing method, and we're actually going to start using some parametric, fact-based mathematical models that will take a look at the data, as opposed to simply asking people, how much time do you think it should take? Level three says we're getting it to an estimation process standardization. We actually have a formal sizing approach and robust parametric estimation has been adopted. Processes are clearly defined. So this is very similar to anybody that's taken a look at the capability maturity model. And this helps us. As we go up the ladder, it ends up with a much more, much more mature estimating process and much more realistic estimate. Now, I know that there's people that say, you know what, we shouldn't even bother estimating. You know, we're doing an agile project. We don't know what we're going to be doing. We shouldn't do any estimate at all. Well, I can tell you that any organization worth their salt, any organization that is either governmental, and government does a much better job than private industry a lot of times, any, any company that is worth their salt is not going to simply throw money at a uncertain minefield. If I went to you and said, hey, can I get $6 million? I'm going to do a project. And you say to me, well, what are you going to deliver? And I go, well, you know what? We're going to just kind of figure that out as we go along. It would be much better for you to pay me on a time and materials basis and see what I'm delivering as we go as opposed to a big budget. But I do need a big budget if I'm going to be doing 
annual budgeting, if I'm going to be prioritizing or anything like that. So when we talk about the cone of uncertainty that happens on software projects, estimates should always be produced, be expressed as a range, not an absolute. Now, you may or may not have heard of the cone of uncertainty. And the cone of uncertainty says at the feasibility stage, think of this like being up 30,000 feet in the air on an airplane and looking down and having, with pinpoint accuracy, having to estimate the size or the cost of a building that you're not sure if it's going to be a hospital or an airline hangar, you have no idea of the size. That's what we're doing at the feasibility stage. We're estimating something that we have no clarity on at all because we don't know what we're going to be delivering. What's uncertain at this point? Software size, the complexity, the team capabilities who we're going to hire, schedule constraints, team size, productivity relationships, uh, relationships between size and effort and size and productivity, and that's not going to be a linear relationship. We're also uncertain at this point about historical data. Now, I do do a webinar called Navigating the Minefield, Estimating Before Requirements Are Complete. And there's ideas that we can use there way, way, way at the very beginning that will at least give us some semblance of why our estimates were so far out. But this is fairly typical. The closer you get to actual project delivery, the more accurate your estimates going to become. So the cone of uncertainty absolutely plagues us when we're trying to produce estimates. What are some of the causes of cost and schedule growth? Well, again, in Kristen Smart's book, he took a look and said there's numerous reasons, both internal and external. The secret of good cost and schedule estimating is don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't be led astray by purely software, by purely expert opinion and the fact that estimates are always going to be off. What causes cost and schedule growth? Optimism. We absolutely assume that we're going to deliver early, that we have enough time. Cost, schedule, and technical misalignment. Like a three-legged stool, all three must be considered in order for a project to be in balance. So we need cost, schedule, technical alignment. Moore's Law, that there's an exponential growth in technology paired with projects that take a decade or longer. Some of our huge, huge projects, the FBI system, the Boeing Max, there's a lot of reasons that they failed. Black Swans, there are some unpredictable, rare, unprecedented events that have a huge impact. The coronavirus pandemic is a situation we could have never, ever predicted. Well, maybe some of you did, but most didn't. And most project plans did not take that possibility into consideration. And then we've got the Lake Wobegon issue, which is project managers and staff are not like the children. They're not all above average. When we take a look at, at software cost estimation, and we throw information into even best parametric tools, you're typically going to say our developers are above average. They're all gifted. In reality, that's not necessarily the case. People will do the best job they possibly can given the knowledge and training on the tools that they are given. But there's also the uncertainty in terms of human endeavors. A lot of times customers don't know what they want until they see what they don't want. But there is some predictability that we can apply. When we take a look at software cost estimation, I kind of sometimes think of this like an iceberg, where we've got our known knowns. That's the area that you absolutely positively know. You're doing a banking system. Every single banking system is going to need to have accounts, customers, products. Those are our known knowns. We do a pretty good job, especially with historical data, of being able to deliver a known known very well. Then we've got right on the surface, those are our known unknowns or our KUs. Those are the things that happen on every single project. We never quite expect them, but we know they're going to happen. Things like 
resources, things like other projects that don't deliver on time. Those are our known unknowns, and we can plan for those. And then we've got our unknown unknowns. Those are things that are underneath the surface. Our risks, how do we mitigate risk? How do we quantify risk? Those are really, really, really important, especially if we're going to do a good estimate. Realistic estimates are built on my known knowns and my known unknowns together with solid and normalized historical data relationships. In other words, cost estimating relationships and schedule estimating relationships that I can develop from normalized, good, comparable historical data. Historical database estimates are more realistic than expert opinion. So we can use things like the DOD CADE system or the International Software Benchmarking Standards Group data. There's a development and enhancement database of over 9,000 projects that the not-for-profit International Software Benchmarking Standards Group out of Australia maintains. Within the Department of Defense, we have the CADE. Data analysis is important. Data must be similar, it must be relevant, it must be comparable. Now, what if you have none of your own historical data and you can't look back? You can't have any clarity. Well, then, if you're within the U.S. Department of Defense, you have access to the CADE. You have access to the International Software Benchmarking Standards Group through a subscription of only $15 a month. You can actually, and I'm not a salesperson for ice bag, but you can actually run your estimates through and see whether or not they are reasonable. Data normalization is absolutely critical. We need to make sure we are using the same units of measure, the same scope, who's involved, what they're doing, what about overtime? And realistic actuals of effort and schedule data actually tell a story. They tell a story because they are what really happened. And history is more likely to repeat itself and give us better estimating than theoretical models. So introducing the ICEA, International Cost Estimation and Analysis Association, Software Cost Estimation Body of Knowledge, or Software CBO. And what are we doing in it? Well, this is my project, and I'm proud to be the, the project leader and lead author in it. So we take a look at software project definitions. What's the scope of the project? And this is one of the major issues. Why is an estimate, why have we exceeded our cost estimate by three times? We might have defined the project wrong. We might not have defined the project at all. Or we didn't give any care and consideration to defining exactly what we were estimating. What's the scope? What are the pieces of software? What is the infrastructure? What are the other pieces besides purely software development and procurement that we need to consider? And if we're doing software development, how much effort will this project actually take? How much time in terms of duration? Not in terms of doing all the PERT network and all that stuff and all of the critical paths. What is the number of hours that it would reasonably take to develop this piece of software? given certain parameters. We can do that. We need to define the scope. We need to define what are the activities. Are we doing an agile project, a waterfall project? Are we delivering a generic piece of software or a specialized piece of software? Now, that's only part of the equation. We need to also have planning, which is outside my software development, my planning, my allocation of requirements into hardware and software, and facilities and other things. I need to also take a look at my software procurement. There's costs associated with those. There's costs associated with my software development. Once I finish my development, there's costs associated with integrating the software onto the hardware. There's costs associated with doing regression testing. There's costs associated with testing other systems into which this whole system is going to work. There's also the costs associated with training, deployment, there's a lot of costs that are never even considered 
when we take a look at software development or software programs, software intensive programs. So in the software CBOC, we start defining and standardizing some of these because that's an important consideration. We also take a look at a lot of software cost drivers. And the cost, software cost drivers are things like software size. How big is this, this piece of software that we're going to develop or procure? Are we using reused or adapted code? Are we renovating something that's already there? How big is it? And in that, we can start taking a look at things such as function point analysis, which is similar to the square feet for software. It's like sizing a floor plan. We size our functional requirements. And there's a lot of different methods we can use. We can use something like simple function point. We can use the International Function Point Users Group estimate size. Or for those people who are still in the software, life, software lines of, or I'm sorry, the sloth based world, our source lines of code, well, what do we do about that? If I'm going to base an estimate on source lines of code, what have I used to count those? Have I used logical or physical lines of code? Because I better not be using physical lines of code because comments are not executable. So I better be standardizing how I count my lines of code. Well, what happens then if I'm estimating something and it's in COBOL versus ADA? Well, I need to adjust for the language. Those are all considerations. And what if I'm using reused code? Is that going to cost the same amount to develop as brand new code? I need to take a look at things like equivalent to new source lines of code. So that's only one piece. I can use a number of different ways to come up with my estimated software, software size within my particular scope. I also need to take a look at the complexity of that software. Is it avionics? Is it real time? Does it have a mission critical component to it. Department of Defense or military projects always cost more, not because the software is more complex, but because I'm doing activities that really focus on a lot of, of reviews and making sure things are right. If I'm using, if I'm developing medical device software, then I know that the pacemaker or the signals sending electric, electrical impulses to the heart absolutely have to be highest quality up. I'd have to have FDA approval, those types of things. So I need to start taking a look at both my software size, my software complexity, how difficult is this software, how robust does it have to be, how high quality do I need sub-second response time, and I can use things such as value adjustment factor. I can use things such as software non-functional assessment process. I can use things like what's known as the COPOMO, the Constructive Cost Modeling Complexity Factors. Those are going to determine how much this project is going to cost me. We can take a look at things like team capability. Are my users up to speed on the, on the subject matter? Are my developers? Are we using power tools or are we using old tools? Those types of things. If you think about building a house and you look at the cost of the project, my cost is going to depend on whether I'm using advanced tools, whether I'm using power nailers, power screwdrivers, whether I bring in roof trusses, or whether I hand or stick build each of those trusses that go into the roof. All of these things come into play. And how good are my, is my team is a major consideration. If you think about it, if you bring in novice plumbers who have never plumbed a house before, my cost and my duration is going to go up. If I bring in master craftsmen who are absolutely skilled at building particular houses in particular areas and dealing with certain types of foundations and rocks, and yeah, that's going to affect my cost and it's going to affect my duration. So I need to take a look at my team capability. What are the tools? What do I have at my disposable, disposal? And what are some schedule constraints? Have we compressed the schedule? Now, what happens if I compress the schedule rather than having it 
having a project go with its normal amount of time. So say I come up with an estimate of three person months, and I say, nope, 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 we're going to have to support not three person months, three calendar months. I say it's going to take me three calendar months because of all of these, this effort I need to put into it. And I say, nope, you know what? We've got to have it done in two. What's the typical thing we do? We throw more people onto the project. And people think, oh, that'll just make it quicker. Did you know that adding more people to a late project actually makes it later? And that seems contrary to, to logic, but the amount of project management, the number of communication, the amount of interruptions, all of those things factor into my schedule, my cost. So I need to take a look at things like my schedule constraints. Once we've figured this out, so now we've got kind of a plan. We've laid out what is in my corral and what's outside my corral. We've taken a look at what are some of the cost drivers. How are we going to estimate our size? How are we going to estimate the complexity, the team capability, the schedule constraints? Those are all important considerations. And now we say, okay, let's take a look at what are some of the estimating techniques that we have available to us. Well, what my choice of estimating technique is going to be based on what do I have for historical data? So I take a look around and I say, what do I have that's similar to what I'm estimating? What kind of data do I have? And I go in and I say, okay, well, it kind of looks like some of these projects may be similar. So I can do some analogy. I might take a look and say, you know what? I've got some really good data points. They all line up. They all match up. But they're way different in terms of size. Well, as we'll find out and as we, as we explore in this whole software cost estimation body of knowledge, the relationship between size and productivity and the relationship between effort and productivity is not linear. So I can't take a size times a magic number and get my um, and get my estimates. Not if I'm using a linear situation. And there are something called diseconomies of scale. So the relationships between size and effort, I can't take size times a magical number. It's usually size to an exponential amount multiplied by effort multipliers, which take into consideration some of my complexity. So it's not a linear, straightforward situation. So I can take a look at estimating techniques that include developing my own cost estimating relationship. I can use a generalized cost estimating relationship, such as COCOMO2, or some of the cost estimating models, the commercial cost estimating models that are on the market, such as Galeris Tier Sim, which is SEER for software. I can take a look at QSMs, SLIM, Software Lifecycle, um, what does SLIM stand for? But um, the SLIM suite of tools. I can take a look at price systems, true planning. And I can take a look at things that use the Kokomo 2 out of the University of Southern California and Dr. Barry Beam's work to estimate parametrically. I may not have that, that capability. I may have to resort to using expert opinion. But in any case, we want to make sure that we have a cross-check, that you always use a second or third technique, no matter what you're using to do your estimate use a second or third technique to validate and cross-check that that estimate is actually true. Then we take a look and we say, okay, on a typical project, we've done our estimate. We figure it's going to be this many effort hours, this much cost, this many days. Well, we need to take a look at something more than that. We need to take a look at risk and uncertainty. And we need to take a look at our typical software growth pattern. How much reuse? How much adaptive code? Did we consider that actually this project and typical projects like it grow on an average of 150 or 200 percent? Capers Jones, who has written 20 to 30 software books, among other books, talks about a 1 to 2 percent on average rule of thumb, 1 to 2 percent size growth per month per calendar month of a project. So if I'm doing a project, 
that is 12 months in length, 12 months in duration, then I'm typically going to have a 12 to 15 percent, maybe even more, growth rate. So I should probably factor that into my estimates to begin with. So we take a look at those types of things. And then we take a look at what's the difference between procured and packaged software and the software estimation tools that we can use. Learning to do software cost estimation properly is like learning to do your time state. And there's a lot more to it than I ever in my function point days ever realized. And a lot more than when I was doing software development. So we need to take a look at a lot more than purely size times a magic number and, oh, that sounds like the other. No, it's a lot more to it. So I can take a look at the cost of licenses. What do I need for configuration? What are the components that I need when I bring in package software? And then if I'm doing life cycle cost estimation, where we know that the investment, the development and the deployment cost of building a piece of software is typically only one third of the overall life cycle cost. I can start taking a look at something more than that. I can start taking a look at software sustainment. And the U.S. Army has a very large initiative right now where their software sustainment offices are realizing that they're underfunded because they didn't estimate properly. So we need to consider that if two-thirds of our overall software lifecycle costs or our total cost of ownership lies in sustainment and maintaining the software, then I need to have some considerations there as well. And that's an important thing to look at. What are the components? What's the definition of maintenance? Is maintenance purely adaptive, corrective, perfective, and preventive maintenance? Or does it go beyond that and also include enhancement? Do we need to cost enhancements the same way as we cost maintenance? What do we mean by sustainment? If software grows typically at the rate of 8 to 12% per year, then we need to factor that in for our overall software maintenance and sustainment costs because our code base is growing. Our functionality base is growing each year. So there's a lot that goes into this. When I got into this project and I got involved with ICS, the International Cost Estimation Analysis Association, when I got involved, I thought, you know what, there can't be that much to this. I've done software measurement for years. I've done software development and project management for years. Software cost estimation and cost estimation of any type of project is a profession. And there's a lot more to it than I ever realized. It's not a simplistic situation of napkin style estimation. So the ICS software CBOC outlines various estimating techniques and cross checks. So we take a look at the things that I mentioned. We take a look at the software size, the software co complexity, the team capability. We can use parametric models that are published. Publish cost estimating relationships. We can derive our own. We can use an analogy of a similar completed project, but we may need to make sure that we normalize and analyze our, analy our analogy data on which we're building our new estimate. We need to use commercial models in some cases. In some cases, commercial models are like using a calculator once you've actually learned to do your times table. In some cases, especially in commercial software development, we have to resort to expert opinion. We just don't have anything better. And we can start using things like rules of thumb. Paper stones, rules of thumb, function points raised to a certain power will give you the approximate team size, the approximate cost of something. We can start using rules of thumb and benchmarks as cross checks to validate that our singular estimate may or may not be within range. This is going to help us get much better cost and schedule estimates. It's really a five-step process that we go through. And it's based on our government accountability office within the United States and DOD best practice guide, supplemented with an international cost estimation, commercial cost estimation practices. So we go through a, a formal process of doing and preparing a software cost estimate and a software duration estimate. First is to do the definition and planning, estimating our scope, our purpose, laying down our ground rules and our assumptions around this estimate. 
Step two is to take a look at what do we have available? What's our historical data that we can collect that we can use to formulate this particular estimate? How do we normalize the data? How do we make it comparable? How do we analyze it? Step three says, okay, now that we've looked around and found out that we either have data or we don't have data, we can select the appropriate estimating technique and prepare a point estimate. So we start out with a size estimate if we can, which the size is a good proxy in software development for the size of the software development effort. So I take my size, I can turn that into an effort. How many hours, how many person hours do we think this will take? From that, I can turn that into a size, and from the effort, I can also turn that into a duration. Step four says, now that we've got a couple of estimates, let's take a look at the sensitivity, the risk, and uncertainty analysis. Is it going to grow? What have we seen happen on certain projects? How can we assess the risk? How can we mitigate the risk? Sensitivity, risk, and uncertainty analysis is something that a lot of people don't know how to do, and a lot of people just overlook. And our last step is to document and present the estimate properly, properly framed, properly bounded, and properly ranged. And as an ongoing thing, the last, which is really not even a step, is to update the estimate as more information is known. So we're, if we recall these, the cone of uncertainty, where it got closer and closer, we need to be updating our estimate as we have more information available. We need to collect that data during our project so that at the end of the project, we can record it and our actuals so that we can use it for the basis of future estimates. All of this builds on top of each other, and all of this gives us much more formality and much more accuracy and realism in actually doing software cost estimation. So when I take a look at the software CBOC, close can count in software estimation and in horseshoes. Software provides a number of unique challenges for, our, for us as estimators to get a realistic or close estimate. Understanding the unique situational, situation and environmental concerns of software cost estimation is critical because software is increasingly a part of almost every program estimate. Software may be a very small portion, but software can actually derail programs because software is a unique animal. Paradigms, software growth, package solutions, cost drivers, and correct usage of historical data are absolute prerequisites to getting better and more realistic estimates. Anyone can do estimate informally as is done today. We can keep ending up with 150% cost overruns, projects that are underfunded, projects that are not given the appropriate amount of time, Projects that end up with shortcuts. Projects that end up failing. Sure, we can still do that. That's the status quo. But if we really want to get to a professional level where we can actually get close enough, we need formal estimating processes, historical data, and repeatable practices. Now, for those of you that may be in the agile space, I'm not saying that we need to micromanage based on estimating. Not at all. Not in the least, but if I have a good project budget based on quantifiable and realistic and formal estimating processes, I have a chance of success. Even though my scope varies and I don't know my exact scope, I have a reasonable expectation that I can manage based on facts. And a final note is that Given Capers Jones' assertion that he made, this is a, a direct quote from him. He said, the software industry has the worst metrics and measurement practices of any industry in human history. He quoted that in his Quantifying Software Global and Industry Perspectives book in 2018. So given that the software industry has the worst metrics and measurement practices of any industry in human history, so let's take that as a given. Together with our track record of over-optimism, we know as software cost estimators, we need to professionalize this whole software estimation industry. 
And Software CBOP provides guidance to create realistic, which I call close estimates, giving us the basis for software contracts and hopefully increased and more successful project outcomes. So at this point, we're at um, 11.59, according to my computer. I'd like to say thank you for listening. Thank you for being part of this. Um, this is my contact information, caroldeckers at gmail.com, my website. Um, this is my, my office phone number. And if you're interested in more information about ICEA or the software CBOC or about function points, contact me or take a look at the um, online site. And Wendy, I think it's back to you. And I'm going to ask if they open it up if there's any questions. Um, you can either write it in the chat box or in the Q&A. Or Wendy, I guess we can probably even open up the phone lines or the um, internet lines. Yep, great. Thanks, Carol. Yep, we, um, I said any questions can be typed into the chat or the Q&A, as you mentioned, and we'll be happy to get to those. I can go through a few just brief reminders while we're waiting to see if anyone has any questions. Uh, the PDU code for the webinar will be sent to you via email. And if you would like to become a premium member of the Great IT Professional, please go to our subscribe page at greatpro.org slash subscribe. Premium membership is $199 a year. It does allow you unlimited anytime access to the online library of over 1,000 PDU hours. And as I mentioned earlier, you can also try out our mobile apps for free. So feel free to do that. And then let me just check here. Um, the first question, what are the top estimating tools, would you say? Um, if, if I've got the question right, I'm thinking what are the top commercial estimating tools on the market? I'm not sure if that's, that's the right right question. Um, that's what I would assume. Okay. There are a number that are used, and it, it really depends on what are your needs. What is your budget for doing software cost estimation? And if you think about it, and I, I use this analogy a lot, or this um, metaphor, a fool with a tool is still a fool. And I can remember learning um, a product that is no longer on the market called Checkpoint years ago. And it was Capers Jones' um, original version of Knowledge Plan, which I think is now morphed into something else. Um, I think it's now called Software Risk Manager. But when I first used that, I didn't know enough about software project or software cost estimation in the first place. And so I would toggle levers. And, and if you think about that, that's like flying an aircraft. If you've never taken flight training to begin with, then if you sit in front of a dashboard of all these toggles, you're going to have no idea what you're doing. So there's some very inexpensive tools. You can use things like the Kokomo 2 model, which will get you interested in just Get your feet wet. Take a look at um, the University of Southern California and Barry Beam's work, and that will give you an idea of what are some of the parameters you might need. Um, there's tools that can run anywhere from $1,000 up to tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for a site license. So there's a lot of tools on the market. The most popular ones used by the Department of Defense in very large governmental industries are, like I mentioned, Galerus Incorporated, SEER-SEM, S-E-E-R-S-E-M. There is Price Systems, um, True Planning for Software, and there's also QSM's Slim Suite of Tools. These are all very robust, very sophisticated, great tools if you're doing large software cost estimation. But again, they're tools that may be well way exceed what you need to do your software cost estimation. So there's other tools such as Cost Expert by Steve McConnell at Construct Engineering, and there's a lot of other tools. So first thing you want to do is figure out your needs and then take a look at tools after that. Great. Thanks so much, Carol. And I think that's the, all the questions that I received, unless you see any other that may have gone directly just to you. But I think we covered them. This is a big opportunity. 
I see it as a big opportunity for software developers or for function point analysts or measurement analysts or project managers to move your industry in a direction where we are collecting good data, where data actually matters and information matters. And we can actually communicate with those in power that an estimate is not purely a back of the nap and high level excellence. If you got the contracted dollars that you really need to be able to do your projects well, that would be a huge success. And software cost estimates that are realistic and are supported by quantifiable data, historical data, are definitely a big step forward. Great, thanks, Carol. And um, one other question did come in. Um, from the successful projects out there, are there benchmarks for the time it realistically takes for a decent estimate to set expectations of management that would be the goal? Absolutely. And um, I mentioned that there was the International Software Benchmarking Standards Group, ISBSG.org, because it's a not-for-profit, so I S bsg.org has a database and they're mo mostly from the top 25% of software development projects because people don't collect data really on failed projects. So the successful, completed, well-run, well-managed projects absolutely are in that database, the, the development and enhancement database. Now, if the question was how much time should it take to prepare a good estimate, that can be anywhere. It depends on your scope. But I do know of organizations that are preparing bids and that are preparing responses to proposals that will take months to prepare a good, solid estimate. And if you think about it, we nobody plans to fail, but a lot of times we, we fail to plan. And so estimating is not a trivial pursuit. It's an actual profession supported and should be supported by historical data, quantified, normalized data, and formal practices. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, now, uh, Carol's email is on the screen, so if anybody does think of additional questions or would like more information, please feel free to reach out at caroldeckers at gmail.com. And if you have questions on the great IT professional, I can be reached at wendy.nolan at cai.io. So on behalf of Carol and CAI's great IT professional, we'd like to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again at future events. And Carol, once again, thanks so much for being here today. And thank you, Wendy. It's always a pleasure to do a webinar for the great IT professional, and I hope everybody has a great rest of your day and rest of your week. Thank you. You too. Stay well. You too.